Fire in the minds of men. Fire in the minds of men. Origins of the revolutionary faith. J-A-M-E-S-H. B-I-L-I-I-N-G. Two in basic books. Incorporated. Publishers New York Library of Congress Cataloging and Publication Data Millington, James H. Fire in the Minds of Men. 2. Includes bibliographical references and index. I. Revolution's History 19th Century. Revolutionists History 19th Century. I. Title. HM 283.B54303.640903479 2750 ISBN. 0465024405 X copyright 1980 by James H. Billington printed in the United States of America designed by Vincent Torrio 9876543 Ion Dense Acknowledgements VA Introduction 3 I234567 Inc. Add Ion The Idea of Revolution I A Locus of Legitimacy The Fact of Revolution I Nicholas Bonneville The Fields of Festival 1724 Book 1 Foundations of the Revolutionary Faith the late 18th and early 19th centuries The Cafes of the Police Royal and Oracular Royalism I Liberty the Republican Ideal, I Freight Eddy. The Rise of Nationalism, I Equality. The Vision of Community, The Objects of Belief 54. The Occult Origins of Organization 86, Boyo Narodi. The First Apostle, I The Pythagorean Passion 1. The Philadelphian Fantasy Book 2. The Dominance of the National Revolutionaries. The MID 19th Century. The Conspiratorial Constitutionalists. I 8 I 5 25 128. The Forest Freight, I Di Ainti Aranalekos Russian Reprise. I Mediterranean Diaspora National vs. Social Revolution. I830-48 The Dominant Nationalists I The Rival Social Revolutionaries The Evolutionary Alt I I Lafayette and The Lost Liberals I Fazi and The Swiss Success I Societies Without Revolutionaries I I I I I I I I I Two Contents Prophecy The Emergence of An Intelligentsia 208 The Saint Simonians I The Hegelians I The Clash 1314 I 5 I 6 I 7 The Waning of Revolutionary Nationalism 324 The Last Heroes I Mass Journalism I Napoleon the Third and Imperialism I The Paris Commune I Marx vs Bakunin I The Lost Romance Book 3 The Rise of the Social Revolutionaries The Late 19th and Early 20th Centuries The Machine German Social Democracy 367 Vaseline Origins 1 Kyochkin Orthodoxy I The Notes Index of Isms in R848 The Early Church The I-84 OS Greedo Communism I Ecclesia A New Party Schism Marx vs Proudhon The Clash of Men I Enduring Issues The Magic Medium Joualism The French Awakening I Ideological Joualism in Germany and Russia 243 Struggle with Revisionism The Bomb Russian violence the slogans of the 60s I the banners of the 70s I the lasting legacy revolutionary syndicalism I the, the German legacy I Russian roots I the master of the general strike I the fascist mutation west frontier the path to power Lenin 443 SOSSI 6S3 builder I the symbiosis of extremes the role of women the French I the Russians I Rosa Luxembourg epilogue Beyond Europe the Germans I A-K-N-O-W-L-E-D-G-M-E-N-T-S-I-T is both a duty and a pleasure to record my special debt to two institutions that sustained me during the lengthy preparation of this work. The Center of Interagonal Studies of Princeton University and its two directors, Klaus Nor and Cyril Black, gave initial support and encouragement. The full-time administrative demands of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, which I have directed since the fall of 1973, have in a sense delayed the completion of this work. But in a deeper sense the Wilson Center has greatly enriched the Soto Hours labor by providing continuing contact with a diverse and international group of scholars and by challenging me to do what I was urging on others, the completion of scholarly work on something that matters. I have been dead during the preparation of this work from various forms of support provided by Princeton University, including the McCosh Faculty Fellowship, the International Research and Exchanges Board, the Rockefeller Foundation, including the Villa Serbaloni, the Aspen Institute for Humanistic Studies, and the Mason des Sciences Bellaham and École Pratique des Hautes Etudes. I owe a special debt to the two principal libraries I have used, the Firestone Library in Princeton during the early stages of work, and the Library of Congress in recent years. Their supportive stars and those of the other libraries mentioned in the list at the beginning of my documentation at the end of this book have my sincerest thanks. This work was also aided in some ways by my concurrent labors as a writer for life in the late 60s and as a member and as chairman of the Board of Foreign Scholarships, Fulbright Program in the RST half of the 70s. Among the many who have aided me in the preparation of this book, I would like to pay special tribute to Stinnick David, curator of S.L. Vic Books at Princeton and the librarian of the Wilson Center, Murney Weathers, an incomparable executive assistant at the center, and Mitch Dieter, an extraordinary editor. I also thank those who gave me specially helpful references, comments, or criticisms in the early stages of this work. Isaiah Berlin, John Talbot, Jerry Seigel, Fred Starr, Robert Tucker, Jacques Codecott, Timor Timofeev, Armando Seda, Sidney Hook, Rondo Cameron, Leo Valiani, Albert Sobel Hall, E6 Inches McWhite, Alan Spitzer, Ori Pelek, Peter Van, Arthur Lenning, and especially Robert Palmer, Henri Walicki, and Joseph Strayer. 
none of my acknowledgments them is, of course, to be implicated in any way with my methods or interpretations. I have been led both at Princeton University and at the Wilson Center from the industry of a succession of helpful research assistants, of whom special mention should be made of Joe Goble, Tom Robertson, Neil Hall, Chris Baum, Wayne Ward, and George Savage. I am also indebted to typists at both institutions, with special thanks to Virginia Kianka, Mary Lexa, and Virginia Benson. In the often lonely business of producing a book like this, one is immeasurably aided by the immediate family. I feel grateful not just to my beloved wife, Marjorie, but to our children, Susan, Anne, Jim, and Tom, who have put up with this work on all of our vacations and much of our spare time with good humor for more than a decade. To them, I express my deepest thanks as I do to friends who have provided all our family with continuing encouragement. In this latter category, I express special warmth and gratitude to the Cadles, to Inga and Karen and Tidon, to whom this book is dedicated. Fire in the Minds of Men Introduction Tis Book, K. To Trace the Origin of a Faith Perhap, the Faith of Our Time. Modern revolutionaries are believers, no less committed and intense than were the Christians or Muslims of an earlier era. What is new is the belief that a perfect secular order will emerge from the forcible overthrow of traditional authority. This inherently implausible idea gave dynamism to Europe in the 19th century, and has become the most successful ideological export of the West to the world in the 20th. This is a story not of revolutions, but of revolutionaries, the innovative creators of a new tradition. The historical frame is the century and a quarter that extends from the waning of the French Revolution in the late 18th century to the beginnings of the Russian Revolution in the early 20th. The theater was Europe of the Industrial Era, the main stage, journalistic houses within great European cities. The dialogue of imaginative symbols and theoretical disputes produced much of the language of modern politics. At center stage stood the characteristic, 19th century European revolutionary, a thinker lifted up by ideas, not a worker or peasant pinned down by toil. He was part of a small elite whose story must be told from above, much as it may displease those who believe that history in general, and revolutionary history in particular, is basically made by socio-economic pressures from below. This elite focus does not imply indifference to the mass, human suing which underlay the era of this narrative. It re-ECTs only the special need to concentrate here on the spiritual thirst of those who think rather than on the material hunger of those who work. For it was passionate intellectuals who created and developed the revolutionary faith. This work seeks to explore concretely the tradition of revolutionaries, not to explain abstractly the process of revolution. My approach has been inductive rather than deductive, explorative rather than donative, an attempt to open up rather than cover the subject. My general conclusions can be stated simply at the outset and, for the sake of argument, more bluntly than they may appear in the text that follows. The revolutionary faith was shaped not so much by the critical rationalism of the French Enlightenment as is generally believed as by the occultism and proto-romanticism of Germany. This faith was incubated in France during the revolutionary era within a small sub for introduction culture of literary intellectuals who were immersed in Joualism, fascinated by secret societies, and subsequently infatuated with ideologies as a secular surrogate for religious belief. The professional revolutionaries who R.S.D. appeared during the French Revolution sought, above all, radical simplicity. Their deepest connets revolved around the simple words of their key slogan, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity. Liberty had been the battle cry of earlier revolutions in 16th century Holland, 17th century England, 18th century America which produced complex political structures to limit tyranny, separating powers, constituting rights, legitimizing federation. The French Revolution also initially invoked similar ideas, but the new and more collectivist ideals of fraternity and equality soon arose to rival the older concept of liberty. The words nationalism and communism were RSD invented in the 1700s to the Esplur, more sublime, seemingly less sellers H ideals of freight ID and equality, respectively. The basic struggle that subsequently emerged among committed revolutionaries was between advocates of national revolution for a new type of fraternity and those of social revolution for a new type of equality. The French national example and republican ideal dominated the revolutionary imagination throughout the RSD half of the 19th century. Exiled Francophile intellectuals from Poland and Italy largely fashioned the dominant concept of revolutionary nationalism inventing most modern ideas on guerrilla violence and wars of national liberation, expressing their essentially emotional ideal best in mythic histories, vernacular poetry, and operatic melodrama. Rival social revolutionaries began to challenge the Romantic nationalists after the revolutions of 1830, and this socialist tradition increasingly predominated after the forming of the First Interiano in 1864 and the movement of the revolutionary cause from French to German and Russian leadership. Social revolutionaries expressed their essentially rationalistic ideal best in prose pamphlets and prosaic organizations. 
Their hidden model is the impersonal and dynamic machine of factory industry rather than the personalized but static lodge of the Masonic aristocracy. No less fateful than the schism between national and social revolutionaries was the conduct among social revolutionaries that began in the 184 OS between Marx and Proudhon. The former's focus on destroying the capitalist economic system clashed with the latter's war on the centralized, bureaucratic state. This conduct continued between the heirs of Marx, principally in Germany and Russia, and of Proudhon, among Latin and Slavic anarchists, populists, and syndicalists. The word intelligentsia and the thirst for ideology migrated east from Poland to Russia, and from a national to a social revolutionary cause through the Russian student radicals of the 186 OS, who developed a new ascetic type of terrorism. Lenin drew both on this Russian tradition of violence and on German concepts of organization to create the Bolshevism that eventually brought the revolutionary tradition out of the wilderness and into power. The revolutionary faith developed in 19th century Europe only in production 5 within those societies that had not previously I legitimized ideological descent by breaking with medieval forms of religious authority and to modi and monarchical power by accepting some form of organized political opposition. In Northern Europe and North America, where these conditions were met by Protestant and parliamentary traditions, the revolutionary faith attracted almost no indigenous adherents. Thus, the revolutionary tradition can be seen as a form of political ideological opposition that arose RST against authoritarian Catholicism in France, Italy, and Poland and then against other religiously based autocracies in Lutheran Prussia, Orthodox Russia. The most dedicated and professional social revolutionaries from Merkel through Blanky, Marx, and Bakunin to Lenin came from such societies and tended to become that rarest of all forms of true believer, a militant atheist. They and other pioneering revolutionaries were largely middle class, male intellectuals with relatively few familial attachments. Revolutionary movements tended to become more internationalist and visionary whenever women played a leading role, more parochial and pragmatic whenever workers were in command. Before attempting to chronicle the drama, the dogmas, and the disputes of this new, secular religion in the making, it is important to linger on the mystery and the majesty of faith itself. The heart of revolutionary faith, like any faith, is re. Ordinary material transformed into extraordinary form, quantities of warmth suddenly changing the quality of substance. If we do not know what it is, we know what it does. It burns. It destroys life, but it also supports it as a source of heat, light, and above all fascination. Man, who works with re as homo faber, also seems foredoomed in his freedom to play with it as homo ludens. Our particular chapter in history unfolds at a time of physical transformation in Europe that was almost as momentous as the RSD discovery of me must have been in the mists of antiquity. The Industrial Revolution was permitting men to leash re to machines and to unleash re power on each other with a force unreamed of in earlier ages. In the midst of those re's appeared the more elusive arm that Dostoevsky described in the most searching work of Shin ever written about the revolutionary movement, the possessed. He depicted a stagnant, tranquil, provincial town that was suddenly inspired, infected, by new ideas. Shortly after a turbulent terror evening, a mysterious re broke out, and the local O Charles shouted out into the nocturnal confusion, the re is in the minds of men, not in the roofs of buildings. Dostoevsky was writing under the impact of two great re's that disturbed him deeply and heralded the transfer of revolutionary leadership from France to Russia. These re's had broken out in Imperial St. Petersburg in the spring of 1861, where the emancipation of the serfs seemed to have an armed rather than calm postions, and in Imperial Paris ten years later, where the arming defeat of the Paris Commune ended forever the era of romantic illusions. The arm of faith had begun its migrations a century earlier, when six introductions some European aristocrats transferred their lighted candles from Christian altars to Masonic lodges. The arm of cult alchemists, which had promised to turn Ross into gold, reappeared at the center of new circles, seeking to recreate the golden age. Bavarian Illuminists conspiring against the Jesuits, French Philadelphians against Napoleon, Italian charcoal burners against the Habsburgs. When the most important anti-Napoleonic conspiracy was ridiculed for attempting to use as a lever something which is only a match, its leader replied that with a match one has no need of a lever. One does not lift up the world. When Burns cited I.L. the leader in spreading the conspiracy to Italy soon noted that the Italian M. had spread the re of freedom to the most frozen land of Petersburg. To there the RSD Russian Revolution occurred in December 1825. Its slogan, From the Spark Comes the M., was originated by the RSD man to predict an egalitarian social revolution in the 18th century, Sylvain Manchel, and revived by the RSD man to realize such a revolution in the 20th, Lenin, who used it as the epigram for his UOL, The Spark. A recurrent mythic model for revolutionaries early romantics, the young Marx, the Russians of Lenin's time was Prometheus, who stole re from the gods for the use of mankind. The prompting faith of revolutionaries resembled in many respects the general modern belief that science would lead men out of darkness into light. 
but there was also the more pointed millennia. Assumption that, on a new day that was dawning, the sun would never set. Early during the French upheaval was born a solar myth of the revolution, suggesting that the sun was rising on a new era in which darkness would vanish forever. This image became implanted at a level of consciousness that simultaneously interpreted something real and produced a new reality. 3. The new reality they sought was radically secular and stridently simply. The ideal was not the balanced complexity of the new American Federation, but the occult simplicity of its great seal, an all-seeing eye atop a pyramid of the words Novus Ordo Seclorum. In search of primal, natural truths, revolutionaries look back to pre-Christian antiquity adopting pagan names like Anaxagoras, Jomet and Anacharsis Clutes, idealizing above all the semi-mythic Pythagoras as the model intellect turned revolutionary and the Pythagorean belief in prime numbers, geometric forms, and the higher harmonies of music. Many of the same Strauss were musicians who R.S.D. played La Marseillaise in 1792 had introduced Mozart's magic flute to French audiences in the same city only a few months earlier. And Mozart's luminous message seemed to explain the fuller meaning of the Jour de Glar that Ruauga to Lyle's anthem had proclaimed. The rays of the sun have vanquished the night, the powers of darkness have yielded to light. Out for introduction the rising sun brought heat as well as light, for the re was generally lit not at high noon on a tabula rasa by some philosopher king but rather by some unknown guest arriving at midnight amidst the excesses of Don Giovanni's banquet. Communism, the label Lenin Nally adopted, was invented not by the great Rousseau, but by Rousseau de Ruisseau, Rousseau of the gutter. The indulgent fetishist and not to Al Streetwalker in pre-revolutionary Paris, rest after La Breton. Thus a revolutionary label that now controls the destiny of more than one billion people in a contemporary world sprang from the erotic imagination of an eccentric writer. Like other key words of the revolutionary tradition, it RSD appeared as the rough ideograph of a language in the making, a road sign pointing to the future. The study attempts to identify some of these signs along the path from Restave to Lenin. It follows sparks across national borders, carried by small groups and idiosyncratic individuals who created an incendiary legacy of ideas. We will say relatively little about either the familiar, formal organizational antecedents of contemporary communism, the three internationals, the Russian Social Democratic Party, or the actual revolutionary conagrations of the period. We shall exclude altogether the contemporary era in which the stage has moved from Europe to the world, and revolutionaries from the anticipation to the exercise of power. We shall deal repeatedly with the linguistic creativity of revolutionaries, who used old words, democracy, nation, revolution, and liberal in new ways and invented altogether new words like socialist and communist. Their appealing new vocabulary was taken over for non-revolutionary usage as in the adoption of Republican and Democrat for competing political parties in post-revolutionary America, or in the conservative cooptation of nation, liberal, and even radical in late 19th century Europe. Revolutionaries also originated other key phrases used by non-revolutionary social theorists in our own century, cybernetics, intelligentsia. Even speculation about the year 2 began not with the futurology of the XXOS but with a dramatic work written in the 178 OS by the same Boer who invented the word communist. The origins of revolutionary words and symbols is of more than antiquarian interest, for, in a contemporary world where constitutions and free elections are vanishing almost as rapidly as monarchs, revolutionary rhetoric provides the formal legitimation of most political authority. The historian's path back to origins leads, however, into often murky labyrinths, and requires a willingness to follow seminal gores in leaps of fantasy to remote times and on long marches into distant spaces. Not six revolutionaries, no less than prophets of the Judeo Christian Muslim lineage, seek to end either, wholly other, in historical time. They tend to become more extreme in the present as they idealize an ever more distant past. Those who glory in pre Christian ruins tended to outstrip in fanaticism, those who looked only to the early Christians. Seven revolutionaries have also pursued a geographical guest for some ideal place where the holy other could be wholly present. Activists have often sought out a small, clearly encompassed area within which perseverate introduction fiction could become material. The earliest utopians of the imagination and the starting places for many key 19th century revolutionaries were often islands. In their search for sacred space, the original revolutionaries made judgments through an apotheosis of location, left versus right or mountain versus plain in the French National Assembly, an inner circle of the dedicated within a broader circumference of the elite head in their revolutionary organizations. What Clutes called the world map of revolution was explored and charted by a new breed of politicized artists and writers. Flags and songs provided a semaphore of salvation. The bourgeois third estates artorially celebrated its liberation from the aristocratic second estate by lowering its knee breeches and becoming sans ulatus only to don the tight new uniforms prescribed by the revolutionary citizen state. The revolutionary faith was built more by ideological innovators than by political leaders. He who held actual power during the original French Revolution was generally a provisional being, 
a creature of exceptional circumstance, not a professional of the revolution. Eight professionalism began later with a different kind of man, an intellect to all who lacked political experience, but saw a revolution object of faith and a source of vocation, a channel for sublimated emotion and sublime ambition. If traditional religion is to be described as the opium of the people, the new revolutionary faith might well be called the amphetamine of the intellectuals. But such characterizations are neither fair to the believer nor helpful to the historian. The wellsprings of this faith are deep, and have sustained men and women on the way to the scold of an executioner as well as to the platform of power. The youthful intellectuals who were the prophets and priests of this new secular religion were largely crying in the wilderness throughout the 19th century, struggling against overwhelming odds for revolutions that they saw coming mainly with the eyes of faith. It was not self-indulgent pity that caused one of the most militant and original early revolutionaries to compare his wandering life of exile to an eternal purgatory of suing without end and without hope. I no longer have a friend, no relatives, no old colleagues, no one writes me or thinks about me anymore, I have become a foreigner in my own country, and I am a foreigner among foreigners. The earth itself refuses to adopt me. Nine revolutionaries were generally sustained in such loneliness and the SPIR and protected from ridicule and indiarianci by secularized 19th century versions of the old Judeo Christian belief in deliviarianci through history. At a deep and often subconscious level, the revolutionary faith was shaped by the Christian faith it attempted to replace. Most revolutionaries viewed history prophetically as a kind of unfolding morality play. The present was hell, and revolution a collective purgatory leading to a future earthly paradise. The French Revolution was the Incaeron of hope, but was betrayed by Judases within the revolutionary camp and grew killed by the Pilates in power. Introduction 9 The future revolution would be a kind of second coming in which the just would be vindicated. History itself would provide the now judgment, and a new community beyond all kingdoms would come on earth as it never could in heaven. A classical, contemporary statement of this belief lies in the founding manifesto of Fidel Castro's revolutionary movement, History Will Absolve Me. He represented his own original revolutionary assault on the Moncada barracks as a kind of Inca Ion. The subsequent torture and martyrdom of his virile fellow revolutionaries was the Passion and Crucix Ion, and Castro's trial by Batista was Christ before Pilate. The Cuban people were promised corporate resurrection, and their revolutionary apostles Pentecostal power. The coming revolution would follow the all the law, the v, revolutionary laws of the Moncada raiders and the prophets, Jose Marti. Point one zero such total belief in secular salvation is uniquely modern. The sublime creation of the age of political religion ushered in by the American and French revolutions not all previous political upheavals even when called revolutions generally sought a new leader rather than a new order. The norm was revolt rather than revolution either the primitive rebellion of outlawed social bandits 12 or the pursuit of the millennium by religious prophets seeking to move beyond nature into a state of grace. Dial 3 Never before was the word revolution related to the creation of a totally new and entirely man-made order. With the militant, Secular French Revolution, a new era opens, that of beginnings without return. 14 particularly after the revolution turned to terror in 1793 and to retreat in 1794, many realized that the revolutionary process would not automatically bring deliverance and social harmony. A new species of man, the professional revolutionary, emerged during the Thermidorian reaction to keep the dream alive. He argued that the French Revolution was incomplete, and that history required a second, now revolution and a new type of man dedicated to serving it. The full-time revolutionary profession began not with the ruling politicians but with the intellectual activists and babies, conspiracy of the equals, who had little common with earlier revolutionaries, except in the imagination of the police. Fifteen yet the traditions that developed from the people of Babyf cannot be divorced altogether from the imagination of the police. For revolutionary and counter-revolutionary forces often lived in a kind of symbiotic relationship. The same writer who RSD6 prophesied a new revolutionary society for France in the late 176 OS1 also coined in the early 178 OS the prophetic phrase less extremes say, touch and dot one one. We shall repeatedly have occasion to note the interaction and often unconscious borrowing between the extremes of right and left. A work of history is, of course, a product of its own time as well as a description of another. The study originated in graduate university teaching during the 196 OS when some West intellectuals began to think of themselves as revolutionaries. Their voices were often shrill one zero introduction and rarely heeded. Most people in the West remained attached to either their material possessions or their spiritual heritage. Yet within overdeveloped universities even more than underdeveloped economies there was often a kind of fascination compounded sometimes with fear and or secret delight at the perceived reappearance of a political species long thought to be nearing extinction. Yet the perspective of history seemed strangely missing among reverend revolutionaries, anti-revolutionaries, and voyeurs alike. Activists seemed largely uninterested in the substantial academic literature that had already accumulated by the mid-sixties. 
and new writing often seemed unusually narrow or polemically preoccupied with immediate issues. There seemed as well to be deeper ideological, cultural, and even professional reasons for continued historical ignorance of the revolutionary tradition. Ideologically, historical understanding has been muddied in the post-war era by the rhetoric of superpower politics. The American and the Soviet states are each the product of a revolution. The RST to proclaim, respectively, a new political and a new social order. ILS. The American Revolution of 1776 was a classic contest for political liberty secured by constitutional complexity. But American sympathy for the simpler cause of nationalism elsewhere, including within the Soviet Empire, has often blunted the ability of American leaders to distinguish between revolutions seeking limited liberties and those seeking the more unlimited greedy cations of nationalistic freedom. The Russian Revolution of 1917 was the classic revolution for social equality. But the Soviet leaders adopted as well the language of liberal and national revolutionaries and debased the entire revolutionary vocabulary by using it to rationalize imperial despotism. Rejecting Marxism as the progenitor of Stalinism, the liberal West proved, in its technocratic era, almost equally hostile to the anti-authoritarian, proud and alternative to Marxism within the social revolutionary tradition. Culturally, historical understanding was complicated in America by the voracious overuse of the word revolutionary in a generally non-revolutionary society. Not only was the word abused by advertisers to announce the most trivial innovations in taste and technology, but also by social commentators anxious to contend that a revolution was occurring in the politically conservative America of the early 1970s. The revolutionaries were variously identified as drifting over children, 19 as the technological innovators they rejected, 20 and as humanistic capitalists who presumably had little in common with either. Not to one, it was only marginally more absurd for a bizarre drifter named Rasputin to characterize his freeform sexual religious commune of UN youth as revolutionary and to invent the verb to revolute. Let the people do what they want, keep them revoluting. Revolution, constantly changing, going on to the next thing. 22 All of this preceded the cacophonous deluge of bicentennial messages about the enduring importance of the American Revolution variously interpreted. The day after the 200th anniversary of the signing introduction when one of the Declaration of Independence, the leading newspaper in the American capital featured the proclamation of the New American Revolution. But its new American Maoism for a post can age seemed little more than an owl sprinkling of intellectual confetti left over from the age of Aquarius. Two, three. Such confusion owls in part from the general mode tendency to attach a magical, binding and unique meaning to the word revolution. 24 in an age when the word revolution is always construed in a positive light. Two inches yet even if the word has been emptied of all meaning by constant overuse, it does not necessarily follow that it will soon cease to be current. 26 Professionally, American academic historians may themselves have contributed ironically and inadvertently to the erosion of historical memory about the revolutionary tradition. By devoting inordinate energy to demonstrating either their political relevance, the 60s or their methodological rigor, the 70s, many have neglected the enduring obligation of open-minded immersion in the legacy of the past. Climateritians and Cleopetitioners alike may have been too content that they possessed in the present either a method or a message for the future and, as a result, were too willing to see the past as an instrument to be used rather than a record to be explored. As a university-based historian during the early years of this study, my method was to ignore professorial debates and to spend my time with old books and new students. The experience gave me an unanticipated sense of relevance. I was repeatedly struck in the depths of libraries with precedent for almost everything that was daily being hailed as a novelty from the rooftops outside. I came to know gurus like Thomas Ismail Urbain, a black Muslim of the 183 OS unknown to those of today. He adopted Islam and Algerian nationalism a century before the same pattern was followed by other black revolutionaries from the same West Indies. Flora Tristan, the Franco-Peruvian founder of the RSD International Proletarian Organization, anticipated today's radical feminism by invading the all-male House of Lords in London of the late 183 OS and removing her disguise as a male jerk to dramatize her cause. The struggle between the old and the new left recapitulated much of the Marx Brown Hong conduct. Even the marginalia of leftism such as ideological skyjackers had precedence in the revolutionary hijacking of Mediterranean ships by Carlo Pizzacane in the RASOS. The concept of a revolution along generational lines was already fully developed in gerontocracy of RA28 by the future Swiss revolutionary leader, James Fazy. Germany had produced even earlier the prototypical modern student counterculture. Rakish dress, long hair, narcotic highs, and sexual lows. Out of this subculture came violent calls for a propaganda of the deed, long before contemporary terrorists. The anti-traditional musical theater of the early 19th century inspired real revolution in the way that rock festivals of the recent past only avowed to do. 
that these were minor discoveries of antecedents along the path directed toward constructing an account of origins that might add some 12 introduction insight from fresh historical research to the substantial work that already exists on the modern revolutionary tradition. Now, two seven, this study will, it is hoped, broaden the base of inquiry even as it arouses controversy by considering Bonneville and Nadir as well as Baby if among the founding fathers, Desimi and Barmby as well as Marx among the communist pioneers, media of communication as well as means of organization and Radchenko as well as Lenin among the authors of Bolshevism. The study necessarily deals with only a small part of a rich story. It will not provide the traditional staples of either comprehensive political history or hundred individual biographies. In addition, readers should be specifically forewarned that I am not following any of three familiar approaches to the revolutionary tradition, the hagiographic, the sociological, or the psychological. Hagiography is a retroactive justicatine of revolution in power the portrayal of precursors in the past for purposes of indoctrination in the present. In this approach, saints and sinners, heroes and heretics are created and catalogued to support the current political judgments of the recognized revolutionary succession. From such an intensely partisan tradition, of course, has come the bulk of historical writing on revolutionaries. The critical historian Clanandi here not only invaluable source material, but also insights from Marxist historical analysis particularly in the period prior to Stalin when relatively free speculation was still permitted the Soviet Union. A massive new Soviet history, the International Workers' Movement, will provide an authoritative code cation of post-Stalinist orthodoxy. The RST2 volumes cover the same period as this book, predictably stressing the actions of workers and the doctrines of Marx. But the new periodization, the international perspective, and the assignment of specie sections to the rent authors all give this work an interest largely absent from earlier versions of the hagiographic genre. To us, a very dear end line of saints and devils is traced in the philosophically rich history of Marxism by the brilliant, exiled Polish revisionist and critic, Lesik Kolakowski. To nine, the sociological approach predominates among social historians, the West 30 as well as non hagiographic Marxists. Three one, that the revolutionary tradition was intimately related to forces of industrial development class conduct, and social change in the modern world is incontestable. But it does not follow as many sociological historians either assert or imply that the revolutionary tradition is simply produced or caused by these processes. Such an explanation may be argued as a hypothesis or asserted as an act of faith. But it can hardly be called a sciency fact and it may actually serve to rationalize restriction on the range of inquiry, which the open experimental method should always seek to expand. Microhistorians of the sociological school have been increasingly critical of those broad histories of the revolutionary era that focus on the diffusion of French power to local elites. Three two. There clearly is a need to understand better the widely different regional and social experiences. Introduction one three of a complex continent and for that matter the human variety continent within the French term Jacobin. Since our subject is not the politics of the revolutionary era but the genesis and spread of the revolutionary tradition, it is necessarily the story of a few ideas and of key people. So many of them have been neglected or forgotten that it seems task enough to enlarge the inventory and provide the historical framework for tracing the development of this small, but immeasurably important subculture of 19th century Europe. The art here will be to maintain a kind of agnosticism on RST causes while bringing into view some relatively neglected data and advancing some new hypotheses. In those areas where intellectual history can approach scientific precision, however, this work will attempt to trace the origins of key words, symbols, ideas, and organizational forms. The psychological method is currently much in favor as a means of explaining data about men and ideas. Since revolutionaries are intense people at war with accepted social norms, they have become favorite subjects for this kind of analysis particularly in America. Three three. The suspicion remains, however, that Freudian, even more than Marxist, analysis may itself be a somewhat dated technique, at times more AP appropriate for the period of the historian than for the historical period. Aside from the recognized difficulties of retroactive psychoanalysis, the fact is that most of the important early revolutionaries seem surprisingly free of unusual personal characteristics. One of the best studies of the emotional side of the original French revolutionaries points out that the future revolutionaries were almost all docile pupils of Jesuits and Arterians. 34 Like most other French children of their time, they were fond of their mothers, of their native regions, and of mildly sentimental, apolitical literature. Revolutionaries in the subsequent, Romantic era were rarely as idiosyncratic and antisocial as artists and poets, and less committed to violence than is generally realized. The schools of thought that played the most important roles in developing a revolutionary tradition all saw themselves providing the rationality that would end violence. Politicized Illuminists promised inner moral renewal, messianic as Saint Simonians, an organic order to end revolutionary unrest, young Hegelians, the peaceful completion of Prussian reforms. 
The fascinating fact is that most revolutionaries sought the simple, almost banal aims of modern secular man generally. What was unique was their intensity and commitment to realizing them. This faith and dedication made the revolutionary trailblazers bigger than life and deeply controversial. Their progress represented, for some, humanity emerging on wings from its cocoon, for others, a malignancy attacking civilization itself. Most communists and many third world leaders still profess to believe in salvation through revolution. Others fear that this belief still retains the power to immobilize intellectuals in the West who lack the experience of living in a society where that myth has been polity and production Cali elevated to the status of Ocho Doctrine. 35 others see the secular faith fading away as a post-industrial society moves beyond ideology into a technetronic era. 36 others may suggest that belief in revolution was only a political ashery in the age of energy now burning itself out on the periphery as the metropole enters the twilight of entropy. 37 the present author is inclined to believe that the end may be a pro waking of the political religion which saw in revolution the sunrise of a perfect society. I am further disposed to wonder if the secular creed, which arose in Judeo-Christian culture, might not ultimately prove to be only a stage in the continuing metamorphosis of older forms of faith 38 and to speculate that the belief in secular revolution, which has legitimized so much authoritarianism in the 20th century, might dialectically pre some rediscovery of religious evolution to revalidate democracy in the 20RST. But the story of revolutionaries in the 19th century is worth telling for its own sake quite apart from any concess of today or speculations about tomorrow. This heroic and innovative record of revolutionaries without power is an awesome chapter in the history of human aspiration. The study will attempt to let the dead speak for themselves without overlooking the continuing concerns of the living. It is a work of humanistic history. The record of what one man who is not a revolutionary found interesting and important about a number of his fellow humans who were. Bokai Foundations of the Revolutionary Faith. The late 18th and early 19th centuries La City i.e. the crucible of modern revolution. The revolutionary tradition, seen from below, is a narrative of urban unrest successively dominated by Paris and St. Petersburg. Paris overthrew the mightiest monarchy in Christendom in 1789-92, triggered new waves of revolution in 1830 and R848, and forged a new model for social revolution, the Paris Commune of 1871. By then, there had arisen St. Petersburg a new type of revolutionary who was to convulse the largest land empire in the world with terror in the late 16 foundations of the revolutionary faith 19th century and insurrection in the early 20th. Three Russian revolutions in 1905, March 1917, and November 1917 brought the revolutionary tradition out of the wilderness and into power. Other cities also played decisive roles, Strasbourg, where German ideas entered France and the national revolutionary ideal burst into song in the 1790s, Lyon where class warfare RSD fueled the rival social revolutionary tradition in the 183 OS, and Berlin, where Marx was RSD radicalized and where a Marxist revolution failed in 1918-19 dooming the communist cause to Ocon and in Russia for the next three years. The site of legitimacy was not revolutionary St. Petersburg, which took the new name Leningrad from the victorious leader. It was the medieval Kremlin within conservative Moscow. Seen from above the revolutionary tradition is a story of elite, intellectual leaders, a thin line of apostolic succession from Guonarodi to Lenin. The former was the leading survivor and historian of the RSD Organization for Secular, Social Revolution, the baby of conspiracy of 1796-97. Like St. Peter among the Romans, Fipo Guonarodi was the rock on which subsequent revolutionaries built. By the time of his death in 1837, social revolutionary leadership had passed to his admirer, Louis-Auguste Blanqui, who retained special authority throughout the Paris-dominated era. Leadership moved from Paris to St. Petersburg through blank Russian collaborator, Peter Kakev. His compatriots assassinated the Russian Tsar in St. Petersburg in 881, the year Blanky died in Paris. When Lenin's older brother was hanged six years later for plotting to kill the next Tsar, young Lenin became the vehicle for vengeance and vindication. Lenin's path from an underground cell to the podium of power began at a particular place in St. Petersburg, the student-run dining hall and library of the St. Petersburg Technological Institute. The revolutionary seed RST took root in the early 189 OS in this spot, where the young Lenin had his RST contact both with the main Marxist classics and with real industrial workers. Within this small area of freedom students not only dreamed of a technologically abundant alternative to Tsarism, but also used their technical talents to form the RST Russian organization of revolutionary Marxists. The road that was to lead from the Technological Institute to the Finland station originated, however, earlier and elsewhere. The RST Green Zone that fertilized the revolutionary seed by turning intellectuals into revolutionaries was the Police Royal in the late 178 OS. This privileged Parisian sanctuary of the reformist House of Orleans incubated those who wrested power from the ruling royal palace of Versailles in 1789 and from the Tuileries in 1792, 
long before the Leninists occupied the Winter Palace in 1917. Thus our story begins with the anti-Versailles, in the heart of Paris, the scene of the RST mode revolution. It leads us to Buonarroti, the anti-Napoleon who conceived of the RST modern revolutionary organization. Chapter 1 Incarnation The modern revolutionary tradition begins with both word and deed, prophecy and incarnation. First came the slow growth of the idea of secular revolution in early modern Europe. Then came the fact of a totally new kind of upheaval within the largest city as the mightiest power in Europe. The idea of revolution long before the second coming of 1917 and even before the incarnation of 178 G-men brooded about the nature and meaning of the word revolution. The term derives from the Latin substantive revolutio, which was unknown in classical Latin but was used in the early Middle Ages by St. Augustine and other Christian writers. One translated into Italian as rivolution in the early Renaissance and then into French and English as revolution, the term initially meant the return of a moving object to its place of origin particularly the movement of celestial bodies around the earth. Copernicans used it increasingly in the 16th and 17th centuries to describe their unsettling new concept of the Earth revolving axially and orbitally around the Sun. The French savant Jacques Amiot suggested that in 16th century France an understanding of these awesome movements in nature was also necessary for a successful politician. To why a uncertain revolution at pre on de ton alter l'équal elham sage ne sait oit plus intermittent de aries de la chose politique. But revolutionary change was still generally seen as a return to an earlier, temporarily violated norm. Review LUTAO and back to more natural foundations of the revolutionary faith order. Three, even the extremists of the 17th and 18th centuries who helped prepare revolutions tended to think of restoring pre existing rights and traditions. Judeo Christian ideas inspired what many consider the RST modern revolution, the Puritan rebellion in 17th century England, and nonconformist religious ideas played a major role in preparing the American Revolution. Four, fanatical religious ideologies dominated the 16th century civil wars that raged within the two great continental powers the Habsburg Empire and the French Kingdom. Both sides and both of these conics have recently been hailed as revolutionary pioneers. The Dutch revolt against authoritarian Spain has been called the RST modern revolution and the earliest modern expression of democratic ideas. Similar claims have also been made for an earlier revolt in which the roles were reversed, when urban Spaniards rebelled against the predominantly Dutch entourage of Charles V. Six, a leading Calvinist in 16th century France was one of the RST modern revolutionaries, seven as was his Bignar, the Catholic League which installed the RST revolutionary reign of terror that Paris was to experience. Eight these Parisian Catholics were probably the most authentic anticipation of the modern revolutionaries. They introduced the term, Committee of Public Safety, the use of barricades, and a program that was truly revolutionary in the sense that it embodied conscious social antagonisms. Eight but such revolutionary means still served reactionary ends. Innovative political practices continued to require aggressively Christian ideologies. The grounds for a new approach were prepared by the exhaustion with religious conduct and by the enthusiasm of the scientific method that produced a crisis of the European consciousness at the end of the 17th century. Although in the ensuing enlightenment of the 18th century, a critical spirit began to regard Greco-Roman antiquity as a kind of secular alternative to Christianity. One, one, much of the growing volume of secular political writing in the age of the enlightenment dealt with the problem of revolution. The pioneering Italian work of 1629 on the causes and prevention of revolution found kingdoms particularly vulnerable to revolution because of their monarchs' misconduct. One, two, an anti Spanish treatise, The Revolutions in Naples, appeared in 1647 on the eve of an uprising in Naples led by the Sherman Massaniello against the Habsburgs. L3. This event simulated the already well developed Italian discussion of political revolution. One, four, polemic writers in England during the Puritan Revolution drew to on Italian writings. One English work on the Neapolitan uprising coined the classic revolutionary metaphor of the re coming from a small spark. Fifteen, the poet Robert Heath appears to have been the RST to link political revolution with social change. Sixteen, speaking of the strange vertigo or delirium of the brain, dragging England into a revolution that went beyond politics. Nor does the state alone on fortune's wheels run round, alas, our rock religion reels. Incarnation, he then suggests that the hope of heaven on earth might replace that of heaven above. Amidst these turnings, tis some comfort yet, heaven doth not why from us, though we from it. And now he comes the full new fantasy, nothing but new utopian worlds I the moon must be new formed by, revolution.17 Interest in the upheaval which restored moderate monarchy to England in 1688 led to a proliferation of anonymous historical studies in which the term, glorious revolution was introduced to the continent.18 In the new world as in the old, revolution became for the RST time a positive political ideal. The most dynamic of the enlightened despots, Frederick the Great, saw revolutions as part of the destiny of nations, particularly new ones. In 1751 he wrote that, fragility and instability are inseparable from the works of men. 
The revolutions that monarchies and republics experience have their causes in the immutable laws of nature. One nine. Frederick generally used the word revolution in the old sense of revolving back to where nations had been before. But he also began the trend among German thinkers of applying the word to spiritual as well as political change. He said of the Lutheran Reformation, a revolution so great and so singular, which changed almost the entire system of Europe, deserves to be examined with philosophical eyes. Later Germans, such as Hegel and Marx were, of course, to use just such philosophical eyes to see in the liberating reforms of both Luther and Frederick antecedents of the modern, ideologically based revolutionary tradition. Frederick the Great's interest in revolution as a spiritual and political event subtly influenced many Germans of his time. He created in Prussia a sense of new prompting possibilities. His impatience with tradition in heirs of state was echoed in the Republic of Letters by the rebellious poets of the Sturm und Drang. Radical Bavarian illuminus surged in the early 178 OS that his secularizing reforms be carried even further through an imminent revolution of the human mind. 21 The opponents, in turn, already saw in such a program in 1786 the threat of an imminent universal revolution. 22 Thus Germany not France gave birth to the sweeping, modern idea of revolution as a secular upheaval more universal in reach and more transforming in scope than any purely political change. This concept was transported to Paris by Count Mirabel, a former French ambassador in Berlin. It helped him to become the leading boy in the early events of the French Revolution in 1789. His study of Frederick the Great in 1788 had proclaimed Prussia the likely site of coming revolt. Twenty foundations of the revolutionary faith illusion, and the German Illuminists its probable leaders. Two three Mirabeau's speeches and writings the following year transferred his expectations of a deep transformation from Germany to France. He became both the leader to bring the third estate of the Estates General into a new national assembly and the RST to succeed in launching a journal without the authorization of the government. 24. His reputation as the outstanding orator of the assembly is closely related to his pioneering role in convincing the French that their revolution, though political in form, was redemptive in content. Mirabeau popularized the luminous term, revolution of the mind, introduced the phrase, great revolution, 25 and apparently invented the words, revolutionary, 26, counter-revolution, and, counter-revolutionary. 27 Mirabeau pioneered in applying the evocative language of traditional religion to the new political institutions of revolutionary France. As early as May 10, 1789, he wrote to the constituents who had elected him to the third estate that the purpose of the estates general was not to reform but to regenerate the nation. To us, he subsequently called the National Assembly the inviolable priesthood of national policy, the declaration of the rights of man, a political gospel and the constitution of 1791 a new religion, for which the people are ready to die. 29 The introduction of the hitherto little used word revolution into the German language sealed the new and quasi-religious usage of the word. Writers and lexicographers initially either bragged or complained, as according to their politics, that we Germans wish so hard to keep Reverend Illusion distant that we do not have even one word for it in our vocabulary. And the French word was introduced into German precisely to convey in its nature an impossible movement with speed and quickness to inspire and suggest a novelty beyond the traditional word for political upheaval. UMW, LCUNG.30 We shall return to this faith in revolution as something totally new, secular, and regenerative into the occult, Germanic sources of this idea. But RST, we must rewind consider the events of the French revolution themselves. For the convulsions that began in Paris in 1789 represented an unprecedented succession of novelties that made Mirabeau's new conception of revolution believable. With mounting intensity and without any clear plan or continuous leadership, France proceeded to create a new political lexicon centered on the word democracy 31 and on a new understanding of revolution as a superhuman source of fresh dynamism for human history. 32 The fact of revolution in the summer of 1789. Absolute monarchy and aristocratic authority were overthrown forever in the most powerful kingdom in Christendom. This was the essential French Revolution. The hard fact that gave birth in Clara to one to the modern belief that secular revolution is historically possible. The sun planned political transformation occurred within a period of exactly three months between May 5th, when King Louis XVI opened in Versailles the RSD Estates General to meet in 175 years, and October 5th, when the king was brought back to Paris as a virtual prisoner of the mob. The decisive event of these V-months was the Third Estate, which represented everyone except the clergy and nobility and was dominated by articulate middle-class lawyers declaring itself to be the National Assembly. Members of the other two estates went over to join the Third Estate. It resolved in the tennis court oath of June 20th to remain in being until the constitution of the realm is set up and consolidated on RM foundations. Following the violence in Paris that led to the storming of the Bastille on July J4, a great fear spread through the countryside. 
Fires destroyed many records and symbols of the manorial system. In the course of August the assembly abolished serfdom and aristocratic privilege and proclaimed the natural and imprescriptible right of every citizen to liberty, equality, property, and security. News of a political act the king's dismissal of his reformist finance minister Necker had read the original unrest in Paris. Nine days after the Bastille failed the Paris mob hung Necker's successor, and political authority was restored by the Marquis de Lafayette. He arrived on a white horse literally as well as symbolically and took military command of Paris on July I-5, lending legitimacy to upheaval, and serving with Mirabeau as a founding father of the revolutionary tradition. Wounded at age 19 while playing for American independence in the Battle of Brandywine, Lafayette had returned to France hoping that the American Revolution might serve as a lesson to the opera's source and an example to the oppressed in the old world. Three, he presented a key to the Bastille to Washington, used American rhetoric to help draft the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, 34 and lent dignity as head of the new National Guard to the fateful march on Versailles on October 5th, middle. Yet the seeming guarantor of continuing order amidst revolutionary change was soon denounced not just by the right, but by the left as well. Burke's conservative attack on the French Revolution listed Fayetteism, RST among the rabble of systems. R5 on the revolutionary side, Gracchus, Babeuf, just a year after the fall of the Bastille, excoriated Lafayette as a conceited and anti-democratic break on the revolutionary process. Three six later revolutionaries, as we shall see, repeatedly raged against him. Mirabeau, also a Marquis but less elegant than Lafayette, was more central to the early revolutionary events. Rejected by his fellow aristocrats for election to the Estates General, the potmark Mirabeau's accepted election by the Third Estate, he infused it with La Passion Politique. The constitutional monarchy favored by Lafayette and Mirabeau could not survive the attempt of the king to e Paris in the summer of 1791 and the outbreak of foreign war in the spring of 1792. Revolutionary France formally proclaimed Arab Blesse in August 1792, massacred I, EU 22 foundations of the revolutionary faith alleged domestic foes in Paris in September, and publicly guillotined King Louis XVI in January 1, 1793. External and internal violence increasingly polarized politics and split the National Assembly into the original right and left. 37 The subsequent equation of the left with virtue dramatized revolutionary lands of Christian tradition, which had always represented those on the right hand of God as saved and those on the left as damned. 38 During this time, the armed masses in Paris tended increasingly to reject the politics of the assembly, arguing that le code roi était toujours gauche et le gauche n'est jamais. 39 The crowd that had invaded the Tuileries Palace to imprison the king on August 10, 1792, broke into the assembly on May 31, 1793 and in the summer mobilized in the levy en masse to resist counter-revolutionary foes in the countryside and on the borders. The subsequent history of the armed revolution reveals a seemingly irresistible drive toward a strong, central executive. Robespierre's 12-man Committee of Public Safety, I-793-94 gave way to a V-man directorate, 1795-99, to a three-man consulate, to the designation of Napoleon as first consul in 1799, and now to Napoleon's coronation as emperor in I-804. After 1792 a growing split developed between the stated ideals of the revolutionary republic and their practical implementation. Marxists have represented this conic as the inevitable clash of the proletarian quest for a social revolution and the bourgeois desire to consolidate newly acquired property rights and political power. But social consciousness at the time was focused on the shared hatred of foreigners and aristocrats, and in pre-industrial Paris the distinction between the working and middle classes was not yet clear. The more significant split was between the political consciousness of the articulate lawyers and leaders of revolutionary France and the mundane, apolitical demands of the urban masses for food, security, and something to believe in. The leaders repeatedly failed to satisfy the Parisian populace. Lafayette, who in April 1792 had favored war in order to rally France behind the constitutional monarchy, was soon round out by the more bellicose and radical Brissot. The Brissotists, or Girondists, were in turn swept aside by the more extreme Jacobins in the late spring of 1793. The relatively moderate Jacobinism of Danton was then supplanted by Robespierre. His reign of terror claimed some 40,000 domestic victims in 1793-94. Yet none of these wars was able to bring stability. Robespierre, the most radical political leader of the revolutionary era, was also the RST to turn decisively against the Paris mob. He broke up its sectional assemblies in the fall of 1793 and executed the extreme enrages or Everest in the spring of 1794 shortly before he too was guillotined in July. The retrenchment that followed, the so-called Thermidorian reaction, checked a seemingly inexorable rift to the left. The new Republican constitution of 1795 was far less radical than that written in 1793, but never put in ECT. 
Two years later the attempt incarnation to three of the baby of conspiracy to organize a new revolutionary uprising was crushed by the V man directory with no difficulty. Though Napoleon rose to power through the revolutionary army and used revolutionary ideas to expand French power, he, like the constitutional monarchs who were restored to power after him, was generally seen not as an heir to the revolution but as its repudiator. The revolutionary tradition reached maturity when Ting broke out again on the streets of Paris against the restored Bourbons in July 1830. Lafayette, by then an old man, emerged to legitimize a return to a constitutional monarchy, and helped establish in power Louis-Philippe of the House of Orleans. The linkage was deeply appropriate. For the original revolution of 1789 that had been led by Lafayette can in a sense be said to have begun in the Parisian pleasure dome of Louis-Philippe's father, Philip of Orleans, the Palais Royal. There in the shadow of the Tuileries Palace, Philip had decided to accept the revolution and rename himself a Gaylite rather than remain loyal to his cousin, King Louis XVI. It was this Philip who renamed the great public gardens of the Palais Royal in which the mob that stormed the Bastille RSD formed, the Garden of Equality. And it is in this revolutionary Garden of Eden, the sunlikely Bethlehem, that the story of the revolutionary faith properly begins. Chapter 2 A locus of legitimacy as Paris overthrew the old regime, its citizens felt an almost desperate need for some new source of authority. The story of this need is usually told in terms of political or social forces, but it can also be told in terms of an ideological and geographical search for legitimacy. If one were to use a single word to describe what the original French revolutionaries were really seeking, it might well be a key term later used by the Russians, a prostitia, to simplify. The desire for radical simplicatian, even of oneself as a re verb suggests in Russian impelled intellectuals following Rousseau to reject personal pretension as well as social convention. A similar striving towards simplicity compelled politicians leading up to Robespierre to rely increasingly on liquidation as well as inspiration. At the roots of everything lay the postulate desire of thinking people to end a simple, unifying norm for society like the law of gravity that Newton had found for nature. In the drive toward revolutionary simplicity Frenchmen melded many estates into one state, discarded innumerable titles for the uniform citizen, brother, and two, supplanted elaborate Rococo art with a severe neoclassicism, discarded complex Catholic traditions in the name of Dame Nature or a Supreme Being, and replaced reasoned argument with incantational slogan. The early revolutionary call for one king, one law, one weight, one measure, pre or later French evangelism spreading the use of the metric and decimal systems. When throughout the inventive revolutionary era, new symbols and societies seem to be searching for the point parfait, the perfect point, within a circle of friends. These were the strangely appropriate names of two leading Masonic lodges that emerged in Paris during the reign of terror. But what was the perfect point on which to base a new secular faith? For many, the progressive simplicatine of the political process provided a kind of answer by reducing the locus of popular sovereignty from a national assembly to an executive of 12, v. 3, and now a one man. Precisely under Napoleon, however, the professional locus of legitimacy revolutionary tradition began. The appearance of conspiracies within Napoleon's armies at the height of his power revealed an unsatisfied revolutionary thirst for something more than pure power. Violence was part of what revolutionaries sought and was in many ways their ultimate form of radical simplicatine. A thousand hopes and hatreds could be compressed into a single act of blood ritual, transforming philosophers into our revolutionaries. As the darkest mystery of the revolutionary faith, violence was at RST mainly discussed by reactionary opponents, who saw the revolutionaries preempting the promise of ancient religions to provide Salu Parla saying that three revolutionary violence has been best described metaphorically as a volcanic eruption or the birth pain of a new order. Because revolutionaries always believe their violence will end all violence, it might also be described as the sonic boom at which controls must be reversed, the vortex of a whirlpool in which a helplessly descending object may suddenly be hurled up to freedom. The mark of blood distinguishes real revolution from mythic melodrama about the storming of a Bastille or a winter palace. The drama resembles rather that of a medieval passion play in which, however, the act of crooky exion rather than the fact of resurrection provides the point parfait for a new beginning. Belief in a purely secular salvation leads the modern revolutionary to seek deliverance through human destruction rather than divine redemption. We shall trace the course of revolutionary violence from a romantic, italo polish phase in the early 19th century to an ascetic Russian form in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Yet the same lava that was to destroy a decadent Pompeii was also to fertilize a new Eden. The original search for revolutionary legitimacy involved not just the raising of a Bastille and beheading of a king, but also the quest for sacred space in which perfection might appear and oracles might speak. The story can be traced through both places and people. It begins in the cafes of the Palais Royal and leads on to the neglected gore of Nicolas Bonneville. The cafes of the Palais Royal know where the literal meaning of Utopia RST became somewhere in the Palais Royal. 
in the cafes that ring the gardens of this great royal enclosure in central Paris. The heavenly city of the 18th century philosophers, found earthly roots. High ideals were translated into coarse conversation. Salon sophistication became bourgeois bravado. Reform moved through revolt to revolution. The Palais Royal had political origins as the creation of Cardinal Armand de Richelieu, the father of raison d'état in modern France. The foundations of the revolutionary faith palace was transformed into an enclosed complex of galleries, exhibition halls, and entertainment centers in the early I-780s and was opened to the public by the reform-minded Philip of Orleans. His avarice rapidly converted it into a pro-table center of pleasure where all desires can be gradient as soon as conceived. For in the late spring of I-787, Philip built a circuit large oval enclosure more than 100 meters long in the middle of the garden for large meetings and sporting events. The cafes in the arcades and the circus in the center of the Palais Royal incubated an intellectual opposition that went beyond the mild, whiggish reformism of the London Coe houses that the House of Orleans had originally sought to imitate. The Palais Royal became a sort of Hyde Park of the French capital, the place where public opinion is formed, the agora of the city in ferment, the forum of the French Revolution. 5. If the French Revolution can be said to have begun in any single spot at any single moment, it may have been in the gardens of the Palais Royal at about 3.30 in the afternoon of Sunday, July I-2, I-789, when Camille Desmoulins climbed up on a table and cried ox arms to the milling crowd. He was suggesting a collective Parisian response to the news that had just come from Versailles about the king's dismissal of Necker. Within half an hour of his speech, the crowd began coursing out onto the streets carrying busts of Necker and the Duke of Orleans I. The moment was dramatic in the most intense and literal sense of the word. The Palais Royal had attracted an expectant audience. A minor operatic composer had set the stage, helping the Moulins to mount what he called La Table Magique taken from the Café Foy. A green ribbon attached to the Moulins' hat, by some accounts a green leaf plucked from a tree, provided the new costume a badge of nature and of hope to brandish against the unnatural emblems of a hopeless aristocracy. The urban hero was, like Saint Justin Baby of Tricum, an intellectual Joao Alice from rural Picardy. In response to his harangue, the supporting cast of hundreds spilled out into the streets. Their immediate purpose was the demonically appropriate one of forcing all the theaters in Paris to cancel their evening performances as if to remove from the city any drama that might rival their own. Having shut the theaters, they converged on the greatest open square in Europe, the place Louis XV, which they helped transform into a theater of revolution. Under the equestrian statue of the king's father, the crowd brandished the busts of the king's dismissed minister and of his suspect cousin. The RSD act of the revolution drama began at 8 p.m. The square went straight away from royal troops created the RSD martyrs of the revolution and the mob responded by sacking nearby armories. The drama was to return repeatedly to this great, open-air theater for its climactic scenes. The execution of the king in January 1, 793, with the setting renamed Place de la Revolution, and the Easter liturgy seal bratted by Tsar Alexander for the entire Russian army after the now defeat of Napoleon in ISIS, renamed again as Place de la Concorde. In July I-789, however, the Great Square was only a point of transit a locus of Legitis I-27 for the Paris mob as it drove on to express in the center of Paris the destruction that had previously begun in the periphery with the raising of 40 royal custom houses. The ultimate destination of the crowd that RSD acquired an identity on July 12th was, of course, the sparsely populated prison and armory known as the Bastille, but their original assembly point had been the Palais Royal. Located about halfway between the Place Louis XV and the Place de la Bastille, the Palais continued to play a central role in the choreography of conduct during the early years of the revolution. The herbatures of the Palais were, in a way, the original people of revolutionary rhetoric, and the mob that assembled there periodically the model for revolutionary mobilization. By early August, police were coming from other sections of the city to deal with the disorders reigning in the Palais Royal and the dangers that could result from them. Seven, if the Palais Royal was not yet uniated behind the republicanism of Demoulins, it echoed the anglophilia of the Duke of Orleans in hailing the events in France as set glorious revolution. As petitions against a royal veto were carried to the assembly in Versailles from the citizens assembled in the Palais Royal, nine who constituted themselves as a kind of informal voice of revolutionary authority in the city. Songs in praise of the soldiers said to have refused orders to re on the people were improvised in the name of the citizens of the Palais Royal. Lo, lacking a king, Paris found a chief in the Palais Royal. You, the locus of legitimacy was the critical issue, and the ultimate protagonists were the king's court at Versailles on the one hand and the handless forum of the people in the Palais Royal at Paris on the other. Standing between them, however, in the summer of 1789 were the newly constituted National Assembly, still under the king's shadow at Versailles, and the formal government of Paris, still at the Hotel de Ville, on the Rue de Rivoli, halfway between the Palais Royal and the Bastille. 
On August 30th a crowd of 1500 set off from the Palais Royal to the Hotel de Ville for the RST of two unsuccessful petitions to gain a general backing for a march on Versailles. Went to finally, on Sunday, October 4th, 1789, a large group formed the Palais Royal. It was joined by other Parisians to march on Versailles the following day, and brought both the King and the National Assembly back to Paris. Paris itself thereafter became the battle old. The King resided in the Tuileries Palace, popular authority, in the Palais Royal just across the Rue Saint-Honneur. The National Assembly was relocated close to both in the drafty building of the former Royal Riding Academy overlooking the Tuileries Gardens. The terminology used to characterize factions within the Assembly revealed a thirst for the spatial sanctity of immaterial ideals. Legitimacy was identified with a physical location, left or right, man, middle dot, tain or plane. The middle position in the assembly between the two extremes became known as the swamp, le marais, the morass occupied by those empty for either land or sea. One of the earliest historians of the revolution characterized le marais in polarized terms that anticipated later revolutionaries' denunciation of the center as unfoundations of the revolutionary faith principled, opportunistic, and lacking the conviction of either right or left. Between these two extremes, men of secret votes and silent cowardice stagnate, always devoted to the strongest party and serving the powers that be.